Welcome to this series of talks on Our Lady. We're continuing these talks. We have spoken of Our Lady's divine motherhood, how great it is, how much it was in God's plan of uh, the incarnation of our Lord. And now we're going to see the privileges, the prerogatives that flow from this privilege of the Divine Motherhood. In order to be a worthy mother, Our Lady needed certain privileges. One is the Immaculate Conception, the other is the fullness of grace, the other will be the perpetual virginity. So let us begin with the Immaculate Conception. And I would like in this first part to start with Lourdes, 1858. March 25, or the night of 24 to 25. Bernadette Subiru has repeatedly handed the messages of Our Lady to the parish priest, Father Père Amal, and he's asking her, ask this lady what is her name? Because I don't know, should I take it seriously? And on the morning of March 25, 1858, Bernadette again felt that interior call to go to the grotto. She hurried to Massabielle to see the lady once more. She was there, Bernadette recounted on the occasion. I asked her to forgive me for coming late. Usually Bernadette was there first, but this time Our Lady was there first. Always kind and gracious, she made a sign to me with her head to tell me that I need not make excuses. Then I spoke to her of all my love, all my reference, my reverence, and the happiness I had in seeing her again. After having poured out my heart to her, I took up my rosary. Every time Our Lady appeared at Lourdes, Bernadette is saying the rosary. The rosary is part of the mystery of Lourdes as well. Whilst I was praying, the thought of asking her her name came before my mind with such persistence that I could think of nothing else. I feared to be presumptuous in repeating a question she had always refused to answer, and yet something compelled me to speak. At last, Bernadette continues, under an irresistible impulse, the words fell from my mouth and I begged the lady to tell me who she was. The lady did as she had always done before. She bowed her head and smiled, but she did, not, she did not reply. I cannot say why, but I felt bolder and asked her again to be so kind as to tell me her name. However, she only bowed and smiled as before, still keeping silence. Then, once more, for the third time, clasping my hands and acknowledging myself unworthy of the favor I was seeking of her, I again made my request. The lady was standing above the rose tree in a position very similar to that shown on the miraculous medal. At my third request, her face became very serious and she seemed to bow down in an attitude of humility. Then she joined her hands and raised them to her breasts. She looked up to heaven, then slowly opening her hands and leaning forward towards me, she said to me in a voice vibrating with emotion, I am the Immaculate Conception. And immediately she vanished. I am the Immaculate Conception. Mysterious words, mysterious words. That is her name, the Immaculate Conception. Our Lord took many names for himself. I am the Resurrection. I am the one who, who is the, the new Passover, St. Paul will say, Christus Pascha Nostrum. Christ, our Passover, our Lord is the resurrection from sin to grace. He's, he's that, that passage 
that brings us to grace. Our Lady is the mother. Our Lady, she is the immaculate conception. She's the one conceived in grace. In the liturgy, during the year, we sing the Ave Regina Celorum during uh, Lent. And we sing these in this beautiful hymn, which goes back to the Middle Ages. O beautiful above all others, exceedingly lovely, tota pulcra immaculata. Thou art all fair, O Mary, o Mary the Immaculate. Father Garrigou Lagrange, whom we are following in our study of these privileges of Our Lady, throws a beautiful thought. He says, if we could have done our own mother, for us it's impossible because we live in time. But God lives in eternity. God is almighty. God is infinitely wise. It is God who thought of mothers. God who made mother's heart, probably looking at, him, at his own heart. He said, I'm going to make a heart as close as possible to mine, mother's heart. Well, if we cannot, if it's impossible for man to make his own mother, it's not impossible for God, because as God, he's prior to Our Lady. And it's not surprising that Our Lady sung in her Magnificat, Fecit miki magna qui potenses. He has done great things to me, he that is mighty. And all generations shall proclaim me blessed. Until the end of the world, people will call me blessed. So, why? Let's ask the question, why is Our Lady giving us her name? Why is Our Lady insisting on that status of being immaculate? Lourdes is 1858. We go back a little bit and Bernadette herself says, Our Lady, her Lady's hand were in a position of the miraculous medal, or her hands open, Our Lady of Grace, with rays coming out of her hands. 1830 is, is La Rue du Bac, the, the apparition of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. 1836 is something we don't know too much outside of France, is the story of Our Lady of Victories where Father Dejeunet, the parish priest of that little parish, just a, a little bit on the north side of Paris, not far from Notre Dame, consecrated his parish to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, 1836, at a clear request of heaven. 1846 is Our Lady of La Salette. 1858 is Lourdes, where she gives her name, the Immaculate Conception. 1917, Our Lady of Fatima, where she speaks of her immaculate heart. Why is Our Lady insisting so much? There are certainly many reasons. On her own part, it's out of gratitude. She has received that gift freely. Of course, she was conceived without the sin, so with the grace, we'll speak about that later. It's an extraordinary gift. She's, she's truly blessed among all women. She's unique. And so she wants to proclaim the glory of God, proclaim the glory of God in thanksgiving. Gratitude is a great virtue. And St. Thomas Aquinas explains how gratitude works. A little child or an adult, first, there's four steps. First. You have to acknowledge that what you have received is a gift. It's not due. It's a gift. Somebody is giving you something for which you have no right out of the goodness of their heart. It's a gift. Secondly, you have to say thank you for the gift. It's not enough to receive a gift for your birthday or for some anniversary. You need to express gratitude, a little note, a phone call, or an email, or something, then you have to use well the gift. If you give a little bicycle to a child, and he's spending all 
evening on his bicycle, he does not even want to eat. Well, you realize, well, that he really enjoys it. If the bicycle stays in the garage, you say, well, maybe I should have given him something else, maybe a fishing rod, maybe, or something else. So the use we make of the gift is a mark of gratitude. You give somebody a book and you see him reading the book all the time, so you feel good because he's appreciating it. And St. Thomas says there's a fourth step in gratitude, is you should try to give something back to your benefactor because he gave you something out of the goodness of his heart. You are now in debt towards him. And so you should give something out of the goodness of your heart. So there's, there's a, a movement of return, giving something back. Give some children coloring pencil. You can be sure that within minutes they'll come back with a drawing. Here, this is for you. It's natural. And a child is appreciative of gifts received and he want to give something back. So I think Our Lady is speaking, of course, God is sending her, but she speaks of her Immaculate Conception on her part as an act of gratitude, a little bit like a bride on a wedding day. They went to church, the priest blessed the rings and bless the couple, bless the rings, and they come out. And then, of course, everybody is embraces the, the bride and, and happy to, to meet the new couple. And especially the, if there's little sisters or friends, and then the bride will show her ring. Look at the ring he gave me. Precious ring, a beautiful ring. And they're, they're all, you know, she's happy to see this. Is, this is the sign of his love for me. Well, this is what we find in Scripture. Our Lady is saying something similar when she says, uh, the queen, uh, sorry, in Psalm 44, with thy comeliness and thy beauty set out, proceed prosperously and reign. The queen stood at thy right hand in gilded clothing surrounded with variety. And for the feast of the Immaculate Conception, we have this beautiful introit, Gaudens Gaudebo, taken from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. Listen carefully. It goes with what we're saying right now. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation, and with the robe of justice he has covered me as a bride adorned with her jewel. So Our Lady sees herself, yes, she's the bride of the Holy Ghost, she's the mother of God, and, and she has received these royal gifts. The gifts, the gifts of the Immaculate Conception, let's speak about it. There's going to be many things to say. We'll just begin now, we'll continue later, because we want to take our time. This is, this is not a... Uh, a rushed sermon. We're, we're studying Our Lady. We need to take time. The Immaculate Conception is the reverse side of a medal, which means no sin, but on the other side it means there is grace. The angel Gabriel could have said to Our Lady, greeting her, Hail Immaculate Conception, the Lord is with thee. So that would have been the same thing as saying, hail, full of grace. But of course, grace is life. Immaculate conception is it's a negative, it's no death. So let's speak about grace. Because gratia plena, full of grace, is equivalent, is, is the, the counterpart of the Immaculate Conception. So what is grace? There's different types of grace. There's sanctifying grace, there's actual grace. There's a grace that remains, habitual grace or sanctifying grace, or we call it the state of grace. Our Lord says, if anybody loves me, he will keep my commandment and we will come and make our abode in him. So we're going to move in, not just come and say hello and leave. That's actual grace. You need help? Can I help you to do something? That's actual grace. 
We need a grace to be patient when there's problems. We need a grace to be pure when we are in dangerous surroundings. We need a grace to, I don't know, to make a sacrifice, offer of a sickness. We need a particular help right now. So God is saying, do you need a hand? That's actual grace. Sanctifying grace is a participation in God's own nature. Many saints have done miracles over nature. Some saints we had not long ago in the month of August, we had a story of St. Hyacinth who, who crossed a river. There was a flood and there was no bridge and he just put his uh, Dominican mantle and made a boat of it and it floated and three monks crossed the river kneeling on, <laughs> like on a blanket. It's not a flying blanket, it was a floating blanket, but miracle. St. Francis of Assisi spoke to the birds, telling them to stop singing while the monks were singing their, uh, their office. This happened in, in Italy, a little place near the city of Rimini. There's a little chapel recalling the place where that miracle took place. So St. Anthony spoke to the fish. So you have saints who had special charism, Don Bosco was multiplying food for his boys. But grace is more than that. When we speak about grace like this, is we speak about sanctifying grace. St. Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, by whom, that by our Lord Jesus Christ, he has made, he has given us most great and precious promise that by these you may be made partakers of the divine nature, divine consortes naturae. He used the word nature. Nature is what makes you able to perform some acts. We are human because, when, because we have received from our parents, we were born, nati sumus, we were born. Nature is something we receive from our parents, the human nature. We're not fishes. Because our parents were not fishes or, or birds. We cannot fly like birds or swim like fishes because we don't have the nature of, an, of a bird or a fish. We act, we ought to, we should act as human, think and speak as human. But St. Peter says we have become by grace partakers of the divine nature. That means we can do divine acts. It's, it's, it is as if by baptism, which when we receive that grace, we receive a new passport. You are citizen of Canada or whatever country, but at the same time, you are citizen of heaven. We have a heavenly passport and an earthly passport. Our Lord also had these two. For us, it's by adoption. For him, it was by nature. St. Paul to the Romans, the Spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God. And if sons, heirs also, heirs indeed of God and joint heirs of Christ. So he speaks about having received from our heavenly father his nature if we are sons and heirs. St. John chapter 1, which we read at the end of each Mass, as many as received him, he gave them power to be made sons of God to them that believe in his name who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, that is grace. Grace is to have in us the divine life. Divine, as we call, habitual grace. It's a seed of glory that will, that will blossom one day in heaven in the beatific vision. So concerning our Blessed Lady, Concerning our Blessed Lady, the angel said, Hail, full of grace, kekaritomene in Greek, which means made most pleasing to God, most lovable, most loved by God, delectissima Deo, most pleasing to God. When some, someone is gracious, someone is it's pleasing, well, here grace is that, that beauty of soul. There are, of course, different kinds of fullnesses. Hail, full of grace. The supreme fullness is, the absolute fullness is proper to our Lord. 
his soul was filled with grace. He was united with the second person of the Blessed Trinity. So it could not increase. So there's the absolute fullness. There is the fullness of superabundance. That's the privilege of our Blessed Lady. St. Thomas will say that the closer to a source, the more one partakes of the source. Well, that's Our Lady. And then there's the fullness of sufficiency, which is common to the saints. We hear that St. Stephen was full of grace. St. John the Baptist, St. Elizabeth was filled by grace. So that's the fullness of sufficiency. So as St. Paul will say elsewhere, so that each of these saints may uh, reach the fullness of the age of Christ, the degree of charity set by God for each one of us. And if that is grace, if grace is a participation of God's own life, if we see in nature life, go outside, look at the nature, look at the trees, look at the birds, look at everything that is alive. Look at it from God's point of view. When God created the world, he wanted to give us a little idea, like a, a drop of an idea of the life that is in this infinite ocean of life, which we call God. And so everything that lives, all the types of birds, of trees, of flowers, of animals, of fishes, of all the, all the human faces, everything that, that lives, all this at the natural level, manifests, reveals to us the infinite life which is in God. And God wants to communicate. But that's at the natural level. And the, 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 uh, the Niagara Falls, you see the water coming down. That's how much, I mean, it's, it's a little image, how much God wants to pour life into his being. There's a natural level, but it's even a million times more at the supernatural level. Supernatural level. And in the gospel, when Jesus started to preach, we see that with Nicodemus, he speaks of life, and uh, God has loved the world so much as to give his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. He's with the, Sam with the Samaritan woman, as our Lord is speaking about this water, this water that I want to give, whoever drinks of this water will never be thirsty again. Our Lord is, is, is dying to give us this life. In the temple, one time he was preaching in a temple, there was crowds of people. Our Lord must have climbed on a step and, and whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And from his belly there will come some rivers of living waters. Our Lord is eager to give life. How much more did he not pour this life into the heart of that woman who he will call mother and alone with the God the Father who will have the privilege to call God my son. That is the Immaculate Conception. We're getting there. In the next part, we will look at the, the privilege itself, what the popes have said, and we'll look at the words and, uh, uh, and we'll try to draw the con consequences for us. Can we, it's a daring question, can we imitate the Immaculate Conception or what aspect of that privilege can we imitate? I will tell you later. God bless. Oh, oh, oh.